hopefully something else. So can you do better? Yes, but only if um, developers are more open and honest about what the power dynamics are um, that sit behind their new development. So it would be better if people didn't come with predetermined outcomes. It would be better if we're more honest and open about what the real red lines are. And it would be better if actually there for the long haul, not just to get through planning. That conversation needs to be about stewardship, not just a one-off kind of conversation. And then my second point about kind of the problem with consultation is that um, even when it actually is good, and maybe you know, developers are trying to do some of those things that I mentioned, it still misses the point and heart and power of communities. You know, if we want good places, if we're really serious about levelling up, um, then we need to move beyond just consultation and actually empower communities to take a lead in setting the vision and actually involving them in delivering that vision through own community ownership and community businesses as well. So for example, taking um, We Can Make It in, in Bristol, so we're a community land trust. So we've set up a model of development which is about opt-in densification, what people want to say yes to. We've worked and co-designed a community design code that sets the rules about what should get built, where, what size, what materials. Um, and we've got a community factory where we can make the cassettes for those homes. So the community wins here and hangs on to much more of the value of development because it's saying yes to what it wants and also it's building skills, jobs and economic value at community level. And there's loads of other communities trying to do this across the UK. So a Nudge down in Plymouth or Onion Collective is Watch It or Heart of Hastings over in Hastings. Or check them out, they're doing absolutely brilliant stuff. But the problem is, we're all kind of fringe of kind of things that just squeeze in when we get the active exceptions of best practice rather than the norm. And if we're going to be serious and move beyond kind of this consultation model, then there needs to be a massive shift in power and status of community in the development process. So I'm going to just key uh, a new campaign for a Community Power Act, which is trying to do exactly this. Without a formal shift in the power and status and resources of communities, we're going to be stuck in this crappy consultation cycle. So the Community Power Act is backed by Power to Change, New Local, Locality and many others. And what it's trying to do is formalise the power of communities so we've got a real role in placemaking. Um, setting up community covenants so you can make it work at community level and also setting up a community power commissioner to make sure it gets enacted across different government settings as well. So this is about not just consulting but about sharing power and sharing resources and then also sharing risks and rewards that come from the development as well. And that's a shift that we need to make to a much more mature relationship, a much more sophisticated relationship than you get with just pure consultation. Thanks, Melissa. Next over to Anthony Thank you very much, um, and thank you everyone for coming here today to come hear us speak. Um, it's a pleasure to sit here. Um, when I first became a councillor, um, development and um, the politics of development was such a huge thing in Greenwich. Um, people were afraid of engaging with partners, people were afraid of engaging with um, Developers, people were afraid of almost the development process. And when I also consider that a bit more now that I've been the cabinet member for housing, and I'm soon coming in as the leader of Greenwich Council from tomorrow, um, it hasn't changed. Development has almost had a very kind of a toxic appeal to it sometimes in terms of how people feel. Um, People have um, negative opinions of it, and it doesn't need to be a negative thing. Um, I have a planning board that I have to appoint very soon, and everyone's saying to me, I don't want to go on the planning board. Um, I don't want to sit there. However, I think planning and sitting on planning is a huge privilege. It's an opportunity to shape the area around you and be a real voice um, for your local residents. But it's also an opportunity um, to take up your duties as a councillor. Um, and do the job that you were elected to do. So the view that you don't want to sit on planning goes almost goes against what you've opted to try and do. But they go to that default position because of how residents feel sometimes about planning. How people feel that they don't benefit from development, that they have no ownership um, of things. Um, just today I was um, opening Crossrail um, with Sadiq Khan. It was my first time meeting him. Goodness gracious, the man is getting very charismatic. Um, and it was fantastic and I was like, Almost shell shocked. 
But I remembered when I was there, um, speaking with one of my residents, um, walking down the road, and the one thing he said to me is like, oh, it's so terrible, Crossroads coming to watch. I said, really? Um, I said, why is that? Oh, everyone's going to have to move, and everyone's going to have to go away, and everyone's not going to benefit from it. And his view of development was that it gentrifies an area. And I thought to myself, that's a really interesting view. Because my view is a new economic route. It's going to open up Woolwich. It's going to allow people to travel into town and get new jobs and yada, yada, yada. But then he had a point. How do people benefit from development? And when we talk, and almost this is where this approach and people's feelings are, is that you have a public that are quite frustrated. You have the local authority who have their duties that they need to uptake, which is think about how they receive this frustration from the poor residents. But almost in all of that is one thing that is lacking, is trust. How do you bring trust back into that process? And a great woman that I was listening to one day said, trust is the process of, um, it, it takes time. It's about rebuilding trust. It's about turning up when people don't like you. It's about turning up when people are willing to shout at you. And then they see you turned up tomorrow, and they're like, oh, you didn't receive enough shouting. I'm going to shout at you some more. <laughs> That's what trust is. And we need to bring trust back into um, development and trust back into um, uh, consultation. Because ultimately, people, um, people need to feel that they have some sense of ownership, number one. But more important, it's important that we present the challenges and the opportunities that surround development to people. And that starts by rebuilding trust. It starts by turning up and turning up on time, turning up early and sitting and saying to people, this is what we can do, this is what we can't do, but we want you involved. One of the things um, I've had the pleasure of doing is trying to rebuild trust in Greenwich. Um, we have a housing delivery program um, that is called Greenwich Builds. Um, and you know, when I first came into that position, it was very difficult. There was a lot of anxiousness about new homes coming to the area. Uh, is my home going to lose value? We don't want this over here. Who are the type of people that are going to come into those housing? People take away their own opinions. Of it. Everyone comes at housing from their own opinions. And it's our job as politicians to help rebuild trust. And that means for me, during consultation, it was taking things to people's doorsteps. You know, how can I go out to people's doorsteps to get them involved? One of the days where you can sit in a room and say, well, we want you to come and talk to us about this, that we're trying to do something. That's not what consultation looks like to me anymore. And as someone coming into the position of being a leader of a council, my job and duty is that actually, how can we take more of our decision making to the doorsteps of people? That's a very challenging thing to do. However, it starts small, it starts incrementally, it starts using councillors, it starts saying, hey, this is what we're doing in your area. On one such scheme that we had called the Brooks, there was a lot of nervousness. There was rumours going around the community that we're getting rid of this playground. Actually, we'll invest in 750,000. One of the ways we overcame that is we went and door knocking leafleting and say to people, we're building a steering group. We want you to design the playground. You know, it's laying out the challenges of saying, we have to build it because we have a housing waiting list of 24,000 residents. That process now has made sure that we've been able to bring together a group of people, both for and against the development, leading designing this playground, and have watched it get approved and are still leading and feeding into the process. That's what trust, um, bringing trust back is. But it also takes another turn is that it helps with participation. Who are participating in these processes? And by going out to people's doors, we've been able to encourage participation in terms of our Greenwich Bills program, ensuring that the right voices are reflected um, in uh, consultation. One of the huge challenges, uh, please remember my one of the huge challenges is, is about participation. When you don't have the right participation in the room, it creates new invisible inequalities. And that's something that we have to make sure is not there in development. So I would almost start with trust, um, laying out the challenges. Um, our public are very intelligent and very smart. You can trust them with that information. Explaining viability and all of these other things, I think you can give them that um, sense of that, that involvement. I think people can deliver. And as long as you're saying to people, how do you work with us to achieve X, Y, and Z? Thank you. Thank you. Expanding away from our title. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, what Melissa and Anthony have said um, 
kind of rem reminds us that uh, you can't really, the question, you can't take the politics out of placemaking. The question is going to be what kind of politics. There are always uh, power relationships, and the question is what a good uh, participation, what, what do those power relationships look like? What is, what is good, in a sense, in politics? When uh, President Trump uh, accused Pope Francis of becoming political, Francis said, well, uh, I'm glad that the president thinks I'm a human being because humans are political animals. Uh, and so I think the question then is how we have processes of placemaking that actually develop uh, people's confidence and agency. As, as Anthony said, people are perfectly capable uh, of being pragmatic, of understanding trade-offs, of, of making good judgments if they are given um, the opportunity, the, the agency. And that's something which, um, through the processes of community organizing, um, people, people can actually do for themselves. They don't need to wait uh, to be consulted. Uh, and I think placemaking can be a really powerful uh, method by which uh, people who are uh, unused to um, being listened to, being taken seriously, making an impact on their neighbourhood, um, actually grow in their confidence and agency uh, as citizens. And this is showing my age, but uh, when I kind of started off um, as a priest about 22 years ago, uh, it was the, the point where the East London Communities Organisation, Telco, was just beginning. Uh, and our first uh, campaigns were very much placemaking. They were, I mean, someone must have had a penchant for alliteration because it was a pollution in a cat food factory in Canning Town and bins on the Barking Road. That was the things people first, to mix metaphors, got their teeth into. Um, but what that led on to uh, was local communities who then started organising on bigger and more strategic issues. So the living wage, which is now uh, kind of mainstream, non-partisan politics, really, everyone agrees with it, um, that was something that those communities that had begun to develop a sense of confidence and agency through placemaking in Plasto and Canyon Town and in other neighbourhoods could begin to say, well, well we, know we, we know we can make a difference. We know we can um, exercise power together when we organise across difference with common good. What do we want to do next? Uh, and for us, the, um, the, the challenge is what does that then look like in housing and development? Uh, what does it look like for local people uh, to have that kind of agency in shaping uh, what the neighbourhoods are going to look like. And that's where um, our work at the moment um, that I'm involved in with Telco, with Citizens UK, and with Create Streets in Shadwell. It's about um, local communities not just waiting until um, someone's asking for planning permission we get out, but actually walking around a neighbourhood and saying, um, well, what, what, what in this neighbourhood is likely to be developed in the next 10 years but hasn't been yet? And how can we as organised local people um, have a say in, in what happens, uh, and that, that's led um, in a, a, a development just um, a few minutes from our church in St George and East. We went out for a walk to see well, what, what hasn't yet been developed, and uh, whether it was Providence or not, we, uh, we found a piece of land that uh, was in the Transport for London Small Sites programme, so actually the largest small site, which had been earmarked to be sold uh, for luxury flats, and through uh, our community organising, and we managed to get that repurposed for a community land trust. But I think that's, that's an example of local people uh, taking the initiative. And that then involves, as Melissa and as Anthony were saying, uh, that involves a different set of habits in developers and uh, in government of imagining citizens as protagonists to whom they might have to respond as well as subjects who would be consulted. Excellent. Thank you, Angus. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I've listened with great interest to a lot of what I've heard, and I agreed with a lot of it. Um, uh, I'm, as uh, Rose said in the introduction, a Conservative MP for a rural constituency in East Anglia in Norfolk. Um, I cut my teeth politically in London. The first time I stood for Parliament was in South London in Vauxhall uh, against a lady called Kate Hay. Um, I think it's probably fair to say Vauxhall fall back and I succeeded in doubling her majority, but I do remember at the time, uh, and I in fact quoted it in my uh, election newspaper, um, a, a, an observation of uh, a, an architect called Ron Hackney, who um, uh, some of you may know used to be an advisor to the Prince of Wales, uh, and he said this, it is a dangerous thing to 
underestimate human potential and the energy which can be generated when people are given the opportunity to help themselves. And um, I've always believed that to be cardinal. Um, you'll, you'll probably know the Conservative Party, we don't like to uh, have too many uh, principles, they can get in the way, they'd be frightfully inconvenient. But it turns out, not only, um, I, I liken, I mean, by the way, one of the, one of the great things about being in our party is you can think more or less anything you like, um, um, uh, and you don't usually get into trouble. I, I have had two friends in the Parliamentary Labour Party on separate occasions um, ask me, because of my views on land and on property, whether I am a communist. And I had to say, well, I don't think I am. I think I'm quite the, the opposite. I believe in property ownership. But it's quite obvious that the system we have uh, doesn't work. Uh, it, it's broken. Uh, and it's been broken for quite a long time, but it's getting worse. I've been to two events this morning, um, one another housing event, the backbench meeting of the 1922 committee's support group for the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, or whatever we're now calling it this week. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the tenor of the meeting was entirely about affordable housing, that was the topic du jour. Um, and then I met later in the morning a, uh, a new uh, television journalist. Uh, she started in the lobby about three years ago, she was working for the BBC, and as young lobby journalists do, they try to uh, uh, find new people to talk to, haven't they talked to before, and somehow I made it onto her list. And in each case, both in the meeting this morning and later with this young television journalist, uh, Tory MPs on the one hand, a leading young BBC television journalist on the other, not what you think of as people who are excluded from the centres of power, in fact people who you might think are, as it were, beginning to make their way in becoming the centres of power. In each case, the subject of not being able to afford a house came up. My uh, young uh, Tory MP colleague said, um, I think she's on the public record as being unable to afford a house at the moment, she hasn't gone, she's certainly not the first MP I've come across who's unable to afford a house yet. And is, saving up for a deposit. The same turned out to be true with this uh, television uh, journalist. And um, it seems to be a very odd world in which people who are thought to be in the centres of power uh, and driving forward change and driving forward policy are just as affected by it as everybody else. And uh, that's possibly the moment at which finally everybody wakes up and notices something that I've been banging on about for 10 years that others have probably been banging out for 20 or 30 years, which we have a system that doesn't work. It's the same as the Duke of Norfolk's comment about the rhythm method as con contraception. He said there's only one problem, it doesn't bloody work. And we have to change it, we have to find a new system. And I'm up for any solution that helps do that. In fact, I think we have to have solutions plural. I know Tom Chance, the Community Land Trust Network, quite well. I held an event with Michael Gove in the House of Commons last week, which um, Tom was present at, because I got to choose who asked the question. I made sure Tom was first. I'm trying to persuade Michael that we should take community housing more seriously. George Osborne, bless his cotton socks, wherever he is now, actually launched the Community Housing Fund with £250 million pounds seven years ago, in 2016, uh, uh, six years ago. Um, and uh, it took two years to get going because they wouldn't listen to the sector who knew how to do it, so it only actually got going in 2018. And then Philip Hammond, bless his cotton socks, closed it down in December 2019. So what was supposed to be a five-year programme was only a 18-month programme, but it was phenomenally successful while it lasted. And, I and other colleagues like Danny Kruger are trying to persuade the department that we should push ahead with that and mm -hmm. get it going and start it again. But in the meantime, what I've been up to, um, and I produced a report for the Prime Minister last year, I brought a couple of copies with me, and guess what, when you open the front page here, I've, I've, I've brought a hard copy, because when you look it up on the internet, it's on the government's website, if you Google the Bacon Review, it will come up. Um, there is not only a rather fetching picture of the Sistine Chapel with um, uh, God creating uh, Adam, uh, painting probably one of the most famous paintings in the world after the Mona Lisa. That's, of course, just excerpt. You'll see the caption there that I put in there, which I, I shamelessly admit I've stolen and Kelvin, Kelvin Campbell, who wrote the incredible book Making Massive Small Change, an absolute firecracker of a book. And Anthony, if you haven't got it yet, you should get it. Um, uh, 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 Kelvin had this in his, in his book, very small. I made it very large. Bottom up meets top down. That's what we need to do. We need to find new ways of doing bottom up meets top down. I took evidence from 250 people for this review, including Kurt Soka, the Bauburgermeister of Tübingen, a city in uh, Germany, and uh, they have what he calls an umbrella cooperative. They have, uh, uh, the city itself cooperates in making this happen and providing what you might call the difficult stuff, the legal stuff, the technical stuff, and then allows a ferment of community action to take place underneath. So you get the legal, the technical, and the land access to the land and the service plots, 
uh, through, uh, through the top down, if you like, but you get the community involvement and which architect it's going to be, and anybody who, who, who has known, knows anything about co-housing will know that sometimes, I agree with Anthony on this point, you can't remove the politics of it. Can we take the politics out of the place making? No, it's deeply political. And I was in Germany uh, talking to somebody in a particular co-housing project, in, in, in Germany, and he said, now, one of the things we have quiet of our users, and I'm going, right, you're, you're told what you have to do in certain co-housing projects in Germany, and not everybody wants that, but it's a choice, you don't have to go into a co-housing project like that if you don't want to, you can found another one on principles that you care about more, but the point is there needs to be um, a, 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 um, a variegated ecosystem in which lots of, um, I'm going to say something even more left-wing in the moment, uh, that, 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 that a thousand flowers can bloom, because we need to solve this problem from a lot of different angles. Uh, Melissa mentioned microsites. I see Gus Zolorich sitting in the front row who spends most of his life trying to find microsites, and when he find, finds them, he then spends years of his life fighting through a bureaucracy to try and make things happen. Gus, who gave evidence to my review, said people don't understand, at least very often not in public authorities, that time is precious, time costs money. And it's very difficult for small operators like us to make things happen. The same is true of community projects. I know Toby Lloyd, some of you will know Toby, who was heavily involved in Shelter for many years, then he was a, a special advisor for Theresa in Downing Street. Uh, and he, you know, self confessed he described himself as a, as, as a fully paid up hairy lefty. That, those are his words. Um, and he's got the, 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 the level of skill and knowledge about the space that rivals almost anybody who could care to name. And yet he could not get a housing project going, a community housing project going in Hackney. I think it was Hackney. Why not? Because it's so bloody difficult. What we need is um, the Bauer Burgermeister of Tübingen's approach, where, um, oh, by the way, Tübingen owns its own bank. The city of Tübingen has its own bank. So he said, finance is never a problem. I mean, we could, we could create that world if we wanted to badly enough, and then allow lots of people to come forward with different approaches. What we have to do is create a world in which, uh, the reason this says here, putting customers in charge can change everything, is because we don't have any power for customers. And at the moment, the people, uh, whether you're doing it for rent, because you can't afford to buy or you don't want to buy, or whether you're doing it for purchase, the paradox is that on the thing upon which we spend more money than anything else, that our dwelling, we have the least consumer power. We have more consumer power over which car you buy. You have more consumer power over the, what colour trousers you buy or what shirt you buy. You have no consumer power over the houses that you buy at all because it's all controlled by a small number of very large people, very large companies who tell you what you want. I want to break that down and create choice for ordinary people. And by ordinary people, I mean ordinary people, including ordinary people who can't possibly, at least not yet, afford to buy. Of course I mean ordinary people on normal incomes who are watching what should be a normal aspiration dis disappear into an impossible dream. It ought to be normal for everybody who wants to, to buy their own house. But I also mean the poor, the marginalised, the homeless, ex-offenders, people who have no chance at the moment of getting somewhere to live. And that double spread there, the thing you get when you get the hard copy is you get these lovely double spreads, which you don't really appreciate on the internet. This was probably done at four o'clock in the morning, so you have to forgive me. It's not quite as beautiful as it should be. But you'll see in the top right hand corner there, that's a prisoner in Her Majesty's Prison, Layhill, making advanced closed timber panels for agile homes in Bristol while being paid the, the living wage. I want to come to Bristol more often. I know it's a ferment of activity in Bristol. Everyone says so. Um, and when he gets out of prison, this chap is going to have some skills that he can sell into the marketplace, building beautiful houses like that. When I was a young undergraduate and I just graduated from the London School of Economics, got my first job, I could have bought a house like that somewhere in London for 60 or 70,000 quid. I'd bit your arm off. It's not like there aren't people who want to do it. It's not like there isn't land. Sadiq has got more than 16 high parks of land uh, in Transport for London. And it sits there going through process after process after process, from consultation after consultation. Mostly it's consultations about consultation. What do we have at the end of that? More ink on paper. We ask almost everybody what we think about housing. We ask councillors, we ask landowners, we ask uh, community activists, we ask um, uh, people who already have a house, uh, I've never yet seen anybody campaign against their own house. I don't know if you have, but I don't think I've ever going to. I've yet to meet the grandmother whose daughter's just had a second baby who wants her daughter's, grand, uh, daughter's family not to be well housed. The people we need to put at the centre of this are the people who need somewhere to live. And when we change that, we'll change everything else. <laughs> Got two, got two, I've got two copies with me. You can, um, you can auction them or do whatever you want. <laughs> it's policy analysis for poetry. 
Um, so we've clearly got some really good models for not just community consultation in what places should look like, be like, how they should change, but also community involvement. Um, what, what can we do to make these models more commonplace? Everyone around the panel has some experience of trying to do this stuff. What stops there from being more of it? Start with Melissa. I think it's it's really interesting in the kind of the, the resources that are required for each each um, kind of effort. I mean, it's kind of galling that it takes as much effort to get kind of planning permission for kind of two homes as it does for two hundred homes. So the ask that is made of people um, is colossal. So there has to be ways of simplifying and making it easier so that people can just kind of step in and contribute in a much easier kind of way. Um, I'm also kind of reminded of um, in uh, Bologna, uh, um, a uh, kind of like a, a, a pattern of trying to make it easier to contribute. You can get just average people to contribute and make that passage kind of be able to step in and make it easy. You know, we have a, a phrase called um, uh, low floor, high ceiling. So make that first act of participation really easy to step into and put no limit on it so it can become really much more complicated uh, and sophisticated. Um, and the kind of like the model in Bologna was a, as a group of elders um, in their park. There was no bench to sit on, and they really wanted a bench to sit on, so they went and got a bench and put it in the park. And they were sat on by the authorities, declared illegal and threatened with prison, because how dare they contribute something to the public realm in that way. Um, they managed to move it on slightly, and Bologna's now got a system of, of commons compacts, and they've got over 100 of these now, so make it easy for cities and for citizens to do this. I think we need a, a similar kind of like a decomplexifying and just making it easier for people to contribute and making these pathways much, much simpler. Otherwise, the ask is too large for most people. Thank you, Richard. I can see you furiously nodding. Do you have thoughts on what would uh, make this more commonplace? Yeah. Um, the first thing, I Nick Boy Smith, who's here somewhere, I think, in fact, it was he who asked me if I'd come um, from Craig Streets and the Chairman of the Office of Place, said in an article he read last year, we should stop worrying about trying to. Um, build more houses and start worrying about how to make houses more popular. One of the reasons there's such opposition to houses, which is what slows them down, is that we know that the things that are supposed to happen as well in, in, the, in a timely way don't. So people are forever bitching about, quite rightly, uh, about the fact that the doctor surgery can't go or that the schools can't go. I had some people in my constituency complain about 106 houses. They said the sewers won't go. Well, my answer is very simple. Build better sewers. It's not that difficult. And we've got to get models and structures rather than the existing very clunky ways we have of taxing land value up to the S 106 and the various other methods that are so clunky and so inconsistently applied. We've got to get smarter, better, cuter ways of doing that. What I'd like to see is a world in which there are service plots of land everywhere, in every village, in every town, so that if you look at the, sorry, this is the, that photograph was uh, taken by Mario Wolf, um, who was in the Department of 28th Industry Housing. It's in Switzerland. It's, a, it's service plots of land. Uh, the answer to the question, uh, where are we going to have annexed houses in this village? Has been decided already now for the next 20 or 30 years. You go down to town hall and get a, a building permit, and off you go. Yes, your both grandmothers probably have to have been born in that canton, um, but they've got a method and it works. And we need to create methods, simple methods, simplicity. So it's really about certainty. Uh, the, the reason there's so much cost built into this is there's so much uncertainty. So identify all the things that are risky or uncertain and de-risk them one by one. Will you get planning permission? Yes, have a local development order. Uh, you know, if, if you make it, will there be services there? Yeah, because we've already put in the service plot, the broadband, the sewage, the electricity, the induction pad for your electric car, whatever it is. Create certainty and a lot of other things will follow. I think to come back on that as well, there's ways to encourage more experimentation mm. in place making and house building as well. So compare ourselves to the Netherlands. Their definition of temporary is 15 years. Mm. So our definition of temporary is 28 days. You know? So imagine who's got the best public realm and the best yeah. housing stock. <coughs> That's an extremely good point. Nat Way, who's a peer in House Lords, Nat Lord Way of Dr. Shortage, makes exactly the same point. He says, you know, we've got a car park. We know it's not going to be knocked down or turned into something else for 12 years. So why don't we get some housing in there, a multi-story car park, that we're putting the right services so there's, there's water, electricity, and everything else. And even if they have to move out after seven years, great structures that we dismantled and taken away. Oh, by the way, that's a lot greener as well. But we don't. We sit there, and, and we, we just, we're done too by council. <coughs> Council to themselves done to by central government. That's what we need to do. Very handy. Yes. Um, so just kind of from more the local authority perspective. I mean, I think um, Melissa and 
Rich and have kind of mentioned the technical aspects of you know like funding constraints, resources, and all of that. And I think yes, trying to work on all that is really important. I think one thing I think we need to be a bit more prescriptive on what um, that kind of good consultation looks like from a local authority perspective, and also um, just defining that more. If you look at Southwark Council, they have almost a development chart of how you, they want you to engage with their communities. So I think just being a bit more prescriptive um, about how what what we how we see um, people's involvement through the development process will help define that because I do think people do need that certainty. But more importantly, is is that that additional consultation, and I think there is a need to go back to to use the local plan process a lot more earlier on um, and feed feed into that because if we have sites that are going through it, put small sites away for us. <coughs> If we have sites that are allocated, so to apologize. If you have sites that are allocated in your local plan, you can build a consultation around that. You can begin to say, "Hey guys, in this area, in a few years' time, this is going to be coming forward here," and work with developers and work with the people who own those sites to kind of build your consultation and have a lot more participation around that local plan process. However, my lobby to you is resources. We councils need more resources to get that done. If you look at our planning departments, if you look at those um, those departments that deal with that process, they're thin, they're <coughs> slimmed down. And to be able to do that, to be able to pay that attention to it, we need more resources and people to do that work. Because ultimately, when we talk about community engagement, when we talk about community development, we sometimes miss out on the value of it. And the value of it is that it builds local leaders, it's an opportunity to build training, and it's an opportunity to give give um, more people the opportunity to shape the area. And there, there is a value in it that we really need to prize, um, and that needs that needs that takes time, and that also takes resources to kind of make sure councils can do that work. Thank you. So mindful of time, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you for struggling through this, like yeah, no. the weather as well. Good. So mindful of time, then moves on just to this bit. So in the discussion that we've had so far, we've had two different views. One, that community involvement, community consultation can actually speed up the process of building the homes we need, changing the built environment in the ways that we need to. But is there also a tension there? Because involving the community, consulting with the community clearly does take time, it takes resources. Um, it, at least in some short term sense, it is a more resource intensive exercise than a bureaucrat simply making a decision. Um, how do you see that tension? Yeah, it's, it's funny because I, I suppose quite a lot of the um, people in the congregations and communities where, where I work would be described in these processes as hard to reach. Uh, and yet their constant experience is that power is hard to reach. Um, it, there is, there's a wealth of, um, of desire to change things. That's what you see through things like the Big Wage Campaign. Um, but it's incredibly hard to get change on housing. So if you, if you talk to people uh, in East London who have been involved in community organizing, say around the Olympics, uh, where people were incredibly pragmatic about, um, at the time when the bid was being put together, about you know, what could we realistically get on the Olympic Park in terms of you know, living wage for those working on it, the jobs, but also housing. Um, the tenacity people have had to um, have simply to pursue and enforce the promises that were made to them has been really hard. If you talk to people in Shadwell who won this side for a CLT about how slow the development is, so I, I do think um, reconceptualizing the problem, it's not that um, people are hard to engage, it's, it's precisely the kind of things we've been discussing this panel today, the kind of concrete suggestions uh, being made by Melissa and Richard in particular, um, I think are actually about unblocking um, processes where local people really do want to make something happen. Do either of you have reflections on that, Richard, Richard and Melissa? I mean, this is speaking up um, earlier on something about trust. Things only ever move at the speed of trust. And so, you know, measure twice, cut once, and then you actually make more progress. Um, it might be slightly slower, but it would be better progress. Perhaps it's faster over the long term, slower over the short term. Yeah. Um, we've talked about a few policies uh, that, that aren't happening um, at the moment. So the Community Housing Fund at the moment isn't active. Um, we've got a proposal for a Community Power Act uh, from new local house change and um, others. Um, but what about one thing that is on the table at the moment is on government's agenda, the levelling up and regeneration bill. 
Uh, what does the panel think about the opportunities or the barriers that that might throw up for advancing community involvement in decisions around place making? Which if I can start with Well, you? it's 342 pages long. I've got it on my desk. I can't possibly separate it yet. Uh, well, I did stupidly put my hands on to, to build the bill committee for it because although I, I generally avoid legislation like the place, because I think there are far too many laws, um, I did go on the housing and planning in 2016 because they were amending my self built and custom house building act and strengthening it. And I felt in this particular case, I ought to make the effort and, and go on it because there's a lot of expertise out there, a lot of uh, folk, planning silks, planners, lots of other people who want to input it. And I feel I am in a position to do something about it. And after that, the last 10 years, I've learned a little bit about this. This space, but to your point about power and getting involved, I mean, I, I'm I, I'm sure a lot more power. I'm a, I've been a backbencher for 21 years, um, and obviously I would like much more power. But I don't have no power. I was able to persuade Downing Street to invite me to do this review, and then I was able to go and ask as many people as I could from as many walks of life. Um, we even had a bishop, uh, the bishop of Paris, uh, Francis Scully's county, who have just been appointed because Church of England has got a big role to play here uh, because it's got such a lot of land, such a lot of land. And I would like to get my paws on some of it and see things happening. And I think the church is moving very definitely in the right direction. But it's starting from a base of, of, of knowing there's a problem but not necessarily having all the answers, which is, which is obviously a, a, an intermediate sort of place to be. But I tried to get the People's Empowerment Alliance, Alliance for Custom House Peach to speak to my review. Because many years ago, I spoke at the Custom House uh, at the Excel Centre. We did a whole series of Right to Build Expos. I think Gus came for one to across the country when the Right to Build Task Force first got going, sort of five, six years ago, and we went to Peach. Uh, we went to, to Custom House, and Peach were one of the speakers. There was a lady there called Samantha, she was very impressive. One of the things I particularly remember is her using the phrase, I mean, to Anthony's point, she used the phrase, under the threat of regeneration. And I remember being shocked by this, because I been under the threat of regeneration, good thing, you know, more easier to buy draft olive oil, so to speak, which I think <laughs> did, did make it into the Daily Mirror once. Um, <laughs> But the point is that, um, and I think they did learn a lot from the Olympics, because I remember being shown around the Olympic site by Seb Kerr and John Armin, who said, we want to learn from the mistakes of the London Documents Development Corporation. When Michael Hesseltine and Jackie Sally went in and, and you know, turned the place upside down and turned it into something fantastic, but a lot of people were left out and ignored. And I think what they said in the Olympic Delivery Authority is, we want to try and avoid those mistakes. And they had some success, probably not as much as they should have done, but they had some success. But what Samantha meant was, we didn't get listened to enough, and so we regard regeneration as a threat. Now, when people like Samantha say, fantastic, there's gonna be regeneration, because I know that I and my family and my community will benefit as well. Whether or not I can afford to buy somewhere or not, it should be a, another consideration, but it shouldn't be the decisive consideration. Then we'll know we've made progress. I spent two or three weeks, I did this project, the, the evidence taking from late April until late June, I spent several weeks trying to persuade them to come and give evidence. And the person I spoke to said, well, I can't just pull a lever, you have to have to go and consult. And there was an enormous, uh, an enormous process to persuade people to get involved because they were, you know, it was a very bottom-up led organization and nobody wanted to sort of be seen to sort of lead them or point them in a particular direction or tell them they were going to have to do something. And in the end, to my great sadness, I wasn't able to get them to take part because you know, I was operating to an extremely limited timetable over a window of about eight weeks, and I couldn't get there involved, although I would have loved it, and it would have made for a richer report. I tried to find sort of similar substitutes. My great hero, Claude Hendrickson, who was one of the founders of the Community self build Agency, who set up community uh, housing in Leeds. He lived in Chapel Town in um, a, a, an area of old Victorian houses in some cases, but some of them were derelict, some had roofs falling off, some of them not lived in. And he was very, very angry as a young man, because he was living, and he knew other people who were living five to a room, while there were other houses that were derelict. And he said to the council, I want to do something about this. And he and 12 other unemployed Afro-Caribbean men, young men in Leeds, built their own houses, which they now own. He's there, he spent most of the last 25, 30 years working in community housing. He's done it from the bottom up. What you actually have to do, I think part of the answer is, is find the exceptional individuals and then make it really easy for them in particular. I haven't yet introduced Claude to Michael Goat, but I've already had a conversation with him in which I'm hoping I'm going to persuade Michael to visit Chapelton so that he can see what happened. It was quite a long time ago now. Because I think I'm to persuade the department from where it is now to where it needs to be in terms of reigniting the community housing program, which is one of the six recommendations in this report. I need to press on every lever that I've got available. Uh, 
Um, time is as ever against us, so I'm going to bring in some audience questions in just a moment. Before I do that, can I ask if Melissa, Anthony or Angus have any reflections on the change that's on the table from government or church? Um, what, what more you would want to see? Melissa? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the levelling up still, stuff still feels very weird to me, because it's generally central pots of money for centrally decided projects, rather than actually kind of bottom up um, kind of um, projects and decisions decided at a local level. If you are going to level up, you also have to level up power and decision making, and that's just not happening at the moment. And then the projects that are coming through are generally quite conventional, big, old school infrastructure projects which are about transport, highways, and kind of, you know, improved roundabouts, which is generally a very old model of levelling up, that the best way that you can do better is if you leave the community and go somewhere else. I would be advocating for a place that we should be improving places that you can thrive where you are, and rather work. than to exit. So um, I think there's uh, much more work to be done on uh, to make any meaningful progress on levelling up. Thank you. Anthony, your take on where we are and what more change we need to see? I mean, um... I think for me is um, again how I how I bring more things to earlier on and how I use my the local authority power to kind of deliver more and um, and that for me goes back to the local plan process. It goes back to ensuring that um, we can take a, a view earlier on how things come together. But more importantly, um, it's almost reform about how we how we deliver projects, how we fund projects, such as we seal. All of these kind of things um, need to be improved um, and. I get the point about um, housing numbers and housing targets. Um, I do think it's very important for us to speak more um, about um, people who aren't in housing at the moment. And I think there isn't enough conversations about that. One of the challenges I've always faced is um, people on our council waiting list is feeding in their voices into the planning process. You know, how do we, how do we, how do we ensure we, we make sure we give people platforms so to speak more about the disadvantages that they face by being stuck in accommodations that are, that are overcrowded and other things like that. Um, on the bill, I think for me, I'm going to be feeding in through um, our, using our local authority to talk about what we've done. I think um, some of the ingenuities that we've come up with or some of the great things that we've come up with um, is almost using right to buy um, receipts to buy properties off the housing market to try and get more numbers because a lot of people do need homes and actually we have to be thinking about more creative ways to kind of deliver that. Excellent, thank you. And Angus, your reflections on where we are? What yeah, I think a huge challenge. I mean, it's exciting what we're saying about um, church land and the opportunities for uh, uh, development together. But I think with, with church land and with other kind of ways in which um, we can get communities to work together on that, a real challenge is building a genuinely affordable housing for a rental that isn't vulnerable to right to buy, so that a community has a realistic chance that if it organises and makes something happen, it won't be the case that in 10 years, 80% of that housing is private landlord. It's a huge challenge to local communities really getting to shape their neighbourhoods. And there's a really simple answer to that. And every time I'm speaking to a council that's vaguely to the left or uh, any, any audience like that, I always point this out. They always scribble furiously. Cooperatives are out with the right to buy legislation. If you think about what a cooperative is, it's a contract between private come contracting parties. And they decide what they want. They spend Part of my, uh, not that list then, it was actually a good thing I did. I think I worked on a campaign to prevent the demutualization of building societies. And the clues in the name, building. By the way, it's an extremely good example of open fill the consultation that the Nationwide Building Society did on 239 houses that nobody else would touch on the Brownfield site. They didn't have a single objection because they really did an exemplary consultation. They changed what they were doing. As a result of it, we really want to change. And we've got to get under the skin of what's happening now. We've got to allow people who are in positions at the moment underneath to have more voice than they, than they currently do. And one of the best ways to do that is through cooperatives. The, 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 there's a convener of the co you know, as you know, the co-op party is a separate party. They always run candidates when they do together with the Labour Party. I think I might say the 29 Labour MPs are also co-op MPs. And on the many things on my to-do list is to sort of novel some of them and, and get them more on board with some, there is some co-op housing now, but if compared with, it, with what's going on in Germany or what's going on in the Netherlands, it's still in the Stone Age. There's a lot more that could be done there, and it's completely protected if that's what they want from right to buy. And my experience with the Bill Committee for Housing and Planning Bill six years ago is that the people most opposed to it were councils, because they thought they would lose control. Well, they would do, because it would be the people themselves running the projects who decided what happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And just out of that, community-led um, housing is also exempt from right to buy. So I always say that community-led is the best kind of affordable housing because it's affordable forever. And if Tom Charles were here uh, from community-led housing's group, uh, he would be telling us about how many CLT projects go forward and get back into the community precisely because the community knows those folks can stay affordable forever. Um, I'm afraid we've eaten our Q&A time because we all got too excited. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much to me, Richard Bacon, uh, Antonia Karake and Angus Ritchie. And thank you to all of you for, for attending.